Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. We're going to continue looking at uh, this paper by M.L. Andreessen, dealing with the evangelical conferences. And uh, we're going to just kind of pick up where we left off. We're going to read a little bit back of what he's talking about. So it, it should be pretty interesting. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful um, that uh, we can enjoy the Sabbath and your presence and fellowship. We know, Lord, that there's many things that we need to learn about our history and this history. Dealing with the evangelical conferences is an important in understanding the issues of righteousness by faith and how things have become distorted in the church. And so, Lord, we just ask that you can give us clear minds and that you can help me present this and that we can understand the things that we read. Be with us in our discussion and be with those who watch these videos. May you guide them. And thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's this these statements that the the people who were working on Ministry Magazine had found. So they had discovered these problem statements, I guess, that they had to reconcile. So they had had the evangelical conferences, and then they start doing this research and find that there are some statements that they're going to have to explain, right? That's basically the issue. And, and this is one of those statements. So the statement says... Uh, I believe the sanctuary to be cleansed, so this is Ellen White writing this, at the end of the 2300 days, to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days, is the new Jerusalem temple of which Christ is a minister. The Lord show me, or showed me, in vision more than a year ago that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary, etc., and that it was his will that Brother Crozier should write out the view which he gave us in the Day Star Extra on February 7, 1846. I feel fully authorized by the Lord to recommend that extra to every saint. And I pray that these lines may prove a blessing to you and to all the dear children who may read them. Signed, Ellen G. White. Now, we, we, we looked into Crozier's article um, in detail this, this week. And I guess it was Wednesday and Thursday that we did that. I think those are the days. One of the, the reasons why we were looking at it in that context had to do with Ellen White's endorsement. So actually, I think I think we looked at Crozier's earlier and we looked at Snow's on Wednesday and Thursday. So anyway, Ellen White has endorsed different things. Smith's thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, Crozier's Daystar article, and uh, the Midnight Cry message of Samuel Snow. And we can see but just because she endorses it doesn't mean that every detail is correct. And, and we could find there were some problems with uh, some things that Crozier said. But definitely, she actually delineates the things that she agrees with in Crozier's article. So it's not just that she says, I want you to read this. She says, he had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary, right? So if we understand the cleansing of the sanctuary, etc. So we would know that that's all connected with the cleansing of the sanctuary. <clears throat> so it doesn't mean every detail of everything he explained is correct. But we're going to look at, at the basic ideas that Crozier has. So um, Andreasen says, I lost no time to get a copy of that extra and read it. As I write this, and I have before me the photostatic copy of the Daystar Extra for February 7th, 1846. And on pages 40 and 41 of that issue, I read Brother Crozier's article. After having discussed certain theories in which he does not believe, Brother Crozier observes. But again, they say the atonement was made and finished on Calvary when the Lamb of God expired. So men have taught us, and so the churches and the world believe. But it is none the more true or sacred on that account, if unsupported by divine authority. Perhaps few or none who hold that opinion have ever tested the foundation on which it rests. So this is, of course, 
one of the main points that the leadership, basically the ground that they gave to the evangelicals in saying, well, we can say the atonement is completed at the cross, you know, because there's just the application that the priest does. That's not the atonement itself. Now, of course, the idea that the priest doesn't have any part to do with the atonement seems rather odd because the Bible clearly says that the Bible never teaches that the sacrifice makes the atonement on its own, right? So that's something that Andreasen has shown us. So then there's going to be these points that Crozier brings up. He says, if the atonement was made on Calvary, by whom was it made? The making of the atonement is the work of a priest, but who officiated on Calvary? Roman soldiers and wicked Jews? No, I think there should be a question there. But anyway, the slain was not making the atonement. The sinner slew the victim. We see that in Leviticus 4, verse 1 to 4, and 13, verse 15, uh, 13 to 15, etc. After that, the priest took the blood and made the atonement. So again, Leviticus 4, verse 5 to 12, and 16 to 21. So, and, and we could look at those verses, but I, I don't think we really need to because it's it's pretty clear. Uh, the third point is Christ was the appointed high priest to make the atonement and certainly could not have acted in that capacity till after his resurrection. We have no record of his doing anything on earth after his resurrection, which could be called the atonement, right? So the issue of Christ being a priest is, is just one of those things that we really need to, you know, Christians need to think about, but most Christians don't really think about Christ being our high priest. They're, they're actually not really thinking this whole thing through. Now, a question. So why do you think people focus so much upon the cross as that's where the atonement is made, especially evangelicals? Why is it that they focus upon that? Seems logical, I think. It's the sacrifice for our sin. Okay. Well, it doesn't seem logical to me, but could it be related to how they look at salvation itself? Definitely part of the equation. You know, everything was done on the cross, right? Christ died for me. And so you can see why, you know, the evangelicals have these problems with Seventh-day Adventists, because to them, Seventh-day Adventists are legalists. And, and that we don't fully accept Christ's sacrifice, that is, Somehow, they think that because we don't believe the atonement is completed at the cross, that we are somehow working out our own salvation through, you know, through works, right? That somehow works must have a part to play. Like this, this seems to be what I've gotten from uh, people who oppose Seventh-day Adventists. So the idea that we don't fully accept the atonement of the cross they just um, equate with the idea that somehow works must be involved, right? And and you can see there is a logic in that, in that um, with the Catholic Church, they have to, you know, sacrifice Christ over and over in the Catholic Mass. They have all of these sacraments that have to be done, right? And so you can see how with the Catholic Church, there's a counterfeit of Christ's heavenly ministry going on that that does involve works. Does that make sense? Yes. Might might be a new idea to, to people. To like, like what does what make sense? The idea to that do. that well, so we know the Catholics have all these these works involved, right? The sacraments that have to you have to go through, all these ceremonies. And that has to be officiated by a priest who is a counterfeit of Christ, right? And so, so okay. we can see why the evangelicals, in, in a sense, because of that counterfeit, they're very resistant to the idea of Christ having to do anything as a priest. They're just focused upon the sacrifice itself. Is, is this because of our understanding of the sanctuary and, and other pe other denominations not looking at the sanctuary at all? Yes. So 
they did, yeah, I mean, hardly any denominations. I've run into individuals, but not denominations that talk a bit about, um, you know, that even consider Christ being our high priest. As I said before, I've, I've looked at commentaries on the book of Hebrews that don't even notice that Christ is our high priest. That is, they're commenting on the verses, but, but it just, it's as if they are completely blind to what's being said, right? And, you know, they're just taking other lessons from it, but not looking at, you know, that Christ is actually our high priest ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. They just completely miss that point. Okay. Um, Going back to John, um, John the Baptist, one twenty nine. Behold, the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. So that's the beginning. And when he, when, it, when, you know, where, where does, where is uh, salvation? Is, is it once he's on the cross, or is it the blood? And when we look at the sanctuary, for us, the blood is what the high priest, as you're say, pointing to now, gives us the answer to when, when is salvation? Salvation is when the scapegoat is taken away. Um, well, yeah, there's, there, I mean, Jesus died for our sins. We all understand that, but we're not in heaven right now, right? There, there's, there's still, the world is still going on. Now, a lot of other Christians, of course, believe that when you die, you go to heaven or you go to hell and you're going to burn forever in hell. And, you know, so for them, they also aren't set up to, to recognize that sin has to be dealt with ultimately before um, we can all enjoy God's kingdom, before we can all enter into, into heaven, right? They, they're not interested in that part of it. They're just kind of, the idea is, you know, you recognize you're a sinner, you say the sinner's prayer, you believe in Jesus, you're still going to continue sinning, right? And then, Magically, one day Jesus comes back, and then you won't sin anymore. That—that's the general view that most Christians have. They're not that interested in overcoming sin. I don't know if it's fair to say that they're not interested in it, but it's something that probably their belief system um, distracts they minimize. them from it. Minimize, yeah. And 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 uh, I can understand why, in the sense that. Uh, say we're trying to, in my life, I'm trying to overcome a sin, and it keeps plaguing me. Well, I pretty much say, hey, it can't. It's never going to happen. It's an impossibility. Yeah. But this, this yeah. is the problem, so, I think, all the way, all the way through here, Theodore. If, if we're going to look for salvation ourselves by ourselves, we're not going to be able to do it. We need, we need the Holy Spirit to help us and guide us. They said, ever since I've been in the church, I pray, pray like you're doing here. Pray for guidance and direction. And this is what we all need to do. And, you know, if we look at, okay, Jesus died on the cross with, with what we're saying here, without the sanctuary, that's it. But when we look at the sanctuary and when we look at the tabernacle and we look at the, the, the guidance of the Exodus when God is leading his people to the promised land, the, the, the sanctuary, the, the, the first sanctuary, the second sanctuary are, are all very important. Without them, there's no um, remission of sin. So basically we have to take our, 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 the, the blood of Christ to, to, to the high priest and the priest offers it and then we work on, on from there. It's, it's, it's like taking the first step is not good enough. It's like mm -hmm. saying what you're saying, yes, we, we, we accept Christ. Is that it? No. Then we have to confess our sins, and if he is faithful and just, and then it goes on and on until he's, yeah, he's going to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from from all unrighteousness, right? So there's a process. Now, and and see that's what the sanctuary shows. It shows this progression, right? You understand what I'm saying? Like there's this yes. progression. Yes, that, that's, that's, that's that's where the, the other denominations are falling down because we take the sanctuary out of the picture. Then we just finish at the cross. Yeah, so we got justification, we have sanctification, we have glorification, right? There's this, you know, Christ character be, being seen upon us. And we know that there is a historic application of that, like as it occurs in history, that there comes an ultimate end to sin, 
in first in the life of the believers, the 144,000, who will definitely represent Christ's character perfectly because his character will be perfectly reproduced in his people. And 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 for many Christians, that's that's like heresy, right? It's like, oh, you know, they, they we can't stop from sinning. And yet they're still going to believe that once Jesus comes back, we're going to stop from sinning, right? This has infected our, our theology schools even. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, so call, calling next generation or new gen, whatever it is, final generation, generation theology. theology. Yeah, doing it. Uh, yeah, seeing it. Yeah, with they the don't scorn. want. They don't believe in it. Yeah. And, and and how do we, how do we re- reproduce Jesus' character? Well, it's Christ who has to do it. We can't Amen. reproduce His character because it's His character, not our character. But if we already have our mm-hmm. mind made up that we're that it finishes at the cross, then everything's done. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to uh, be praying for the Holy Spirit to guide us. Well, Christ was led of Himself; He did nothing. So we have to understand what we have to do, and you know, our, ours is a full submission to His guidance, His Holy Spirit's guidance. Yeah, and see, submission. you know, there's there's a thing called Sub- faith, and there's a thing called presumption, and most people think that their presumption is faith. The mission begins first with a decision, right? You have mm-hmm. to, that's how all the coming sin happens in my life. If I make a decision and then God gives the power to it. Yeah. So some people think, well, we make a decision to confess our sins and say that we're a sinner, right? Admit that we're a sinner. And then we ask God to forgive us. And then that's the decision that we make. You know, God doesn't make that decision for us, right? So when a Christian believes that, he doesn't believe he's saved by works, right? By confessing his sins. But they will think that if if they're going to continue to do that process, to see themselves as sinners and to trust in Christ, and that somehow if that ended up in them overcoming sin, then that would be bad, right? Because that would be righteousness by works. I mean... It, you understand that there's these, this problem that's ingrained in people's thinking that's really hard to get past. Um, you know, for Seventh-day Adventists, we're scared of time setting, like anything that that, that smacks of time setting. For, for evangelicals, anything that, that smacks of any kind of righteousness that somehow human beings do, that, that's the thing that scares them, right? But we can see that Christ came to save us from our sins and not just, you know, when he comes back the second time. Right. I mean, it's true when he comes back the second time that sin and sinners are going to be dealt with. But in his first coming, he has given us salvation. Right. He came to save us from our sins. And wait, wait, just because wait, we wait. don't see ourselves as righteous, just because we struggle and 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 go through, you know, this experience of overcoming sin, we can never say to ourselves, well, it can never be done. Right. I mean, if we we believe that I can never overcome and I just have to accept that and I'm going to wait till Jesus comes back, we will be lost. We're talking, right, because... different type, we're talking different types of Christian here, Theodore. I was Catholic for 42 years of my life uh, yeah. by name, but I, I believe because I was Catholic, I was okay. And I spoke to someone to the, this week, actually, who they believe because they're a denomination, they're, they're saved. But I, I'd, mm-hmm. I'd never opened the Bible in my, in my life. When I was 42 and opened the Bible, then the war started in my mind, and then I mm-hmm. realized that I was on the wrong, wrong side. But most people... As Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Um, and I, I was, I was honest in my stupidity. Um, I just thought because I was Catholic, I was okay. And this is what I see in this discussion group. I mean, as well, they're, they're basically um, they're ignorant of the of the word. And basically, when mm-hmm. we open the word and open our heart, God, God will guide us a hundred percent. But you know, we, we need that Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen. You with to seek with all the heart. And we need to have that 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 honesty of Hebrews four thirteen. You know, neither is any creature not manifest in sight, but all things are naked. If we realise, I can't. I, I always amaze, and I, I think when I was speaking to you, we were saying the same thing. You know, these people like 
um, the other groups of the, the, the here that who do know their word and they're, they're, what you're saying they're lying and, and doing things this doesn't make sense like we're, we're not dealing with man who can you can hide things from we're talking about the king of the universe who is giving us eternal life if we'll only be obedient and basically we're, we're trying to fool him but you know if we really open our heart, the Holy Spirit will guide one hundred percent. Sparky, yeah. I like what you said there about sincerity of heart. Really uh, reminds me of a, a series of evangelistic series in, in India that an evangelist was telling me about. There was a woman in the in the crowd that she thought that to be saved, she had to know English, and she only knew two words in English the first two months of the year. And she came to the front repeating, oh, January, oh, February, oh, January, oh, February. And she was saved, I'm sure, because of the sincerity of her heart. Amen. Amen. God, 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 God is the one who is guiding. When I came, uh, no, like I, 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 I've mentioned it to you. When I came into the faith, I, I, I'd never read a book in my life. When I, The Bible was the first book I ever read cover to cover. And I did year 11, but always got around reading. I'd read bits or get parts. But, you know. The, the the greatest victory of my life was reading the Bible, and then and that then I knew nothing. But now and that's why now I I talk to people about Arthur Maxwell Bible stories. And when my wife and I first start reading those to our children, that was when we started to understand the Bible. But most people don't know. And but again, what you're saying is right, uh, Kelly. That basically, if people open their heart, they can say anything, and God will like the, the angels. They will change it, what we need to say and and give us what to say. God wants the heart, and it's one, you know, as I said, Hebrews 4, 4 13 is, you know, as well as five, Hebrews 4 12, which is actually even better still. But um, God knows the heart, He knows the mind, He knows what He can do with us if we'll only submit to Him. And in fairness and balance, you know, He takes us where we are, Amen. He doesn't leave us there and brings us forward in, in, the, in the walk of life of sanctification, but yeah. Definitely simple is simple, simple salvation. The heart, amen. The heart, and then the mind. I agree. Yeah, now there's um, a book which I haven't read, but I have watched the guy's video. Um, guy named Neil Van Leeuwen, and he's an atheist. Um, but he, he wrote a book called Religion is Make Believe A Theory of Belief, Imagination, and Group Identity course it's ridiculous but he does say something that that is actually quite true and that is that for many people their religious belief is just make believe right yes yeah. make it, believe you know, is and not practice sort of a... well they have a form of godliness but deny the power of god right yeah, that but... that's make believe right? so now, the reason why people do this, of course, is because we all have a knowledge of God in some ways. So somehow we have to avoid God. And one of the ways to avoid him is to pretend to believe in him, right? To say that you believe in God. And then this way you don't have to deal with uh, the reality of your sin. And, you know, I mean, that's what to understand righteousness by faith. It's such a, an opportunity and a privilege that God is giving us. Right. I mean, it's salvation, <laughs> you know, that he wants to live with us, that he wants to communicate with us, that he wants to fellowship with us. And, and we can pretend, you know, that we have a relation with God because we believe certain things or because I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist or, you know, because I believe the right things, whatever those things are. And they're usually something to do with a group. Right. So we want to be recognized by others as being good, right? We're not even really that concerned about what God thinks. We're more concerned about what other people think. And so if other people think we're okay, well, then we're okay, right? So kind of then you find a group that's going to – what's that? So it's kind of a party spirit type thing? Yeah, well, definitely. So, so you know – when we when we're dealing with this problem, and this problem isn't you know just the problem out there in the other churches, and it's not just a problem in the Adventist Church. It's been a problem in this movement. It's a problem in our lives. We know the truth, but 
are we going to allow that truth to do the work that God wants to do in us? And that's and a scary realize- and they realize that there's freedom. There's freedom from uh, when you overcome sin. You know, not sinning. Yeah, there's great there freedom. Is, yeah. I don't. I don't know if they see that or not. <laughs> Some people. But there don't. is a there's a lot more than just you know stopping doing bad things, right? I mean, yeah. there's a whole, a whole life of everything that we do, all of our motives, all of our goals, all of our plans. All of these things need to be surrendered to God because. One is he knows everything we don't, and we need to trust him. And and that's where I, I think people like uh, Neil Van Liu and uh, get uh, sort of confused about because uh, he uses the story of Thomas, right? So Thomas, you know, says, "Well, unless I can put my hand in his side and my fingers and the, the prints in his in, or in the holes in his hands, I won't believe." And then Jesus says to him, you know, you have seen and believed, blessed is those that have not seen and believe. And so he somehow gets from that story, I'm not really quite sure, that somehow uh, belief, you know, faith is without evidence. And that's, of course, not what Jesus says at all, right? Because all all belief is based upon evidence. But there is something Substance. that we have to trust because of our relationship and the knowledge of God. Because everything we believe is pretty much by faith. Even somebody who says he's a scientist, and he just believes scientists. You know, he hasn't actually done mm. all the experiments himself. Mm. So, substance of things unseen. Faith is yeah, faith substance. is the evidence of things hoped for, or the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen, right? Right. So there is, but it's it's based upon knowing God, right? So there is, and that is a very powerful evidence. Knowing somebody and trusting them because they have proven themselves to you, that's what faith is, right? If I just you know trust somebody blindly who I don't know and I have no reason to trust him. Like, you know, a scam artist, um, you know, connects to me, you know, phones me and I just trust him. Well, that's just presumption. That's not really faith. You could say, well, I I had faith that he was going to, you know, give me that million dollars when I sent him that five hundred dollars or whatever. You know, well, that another word, that's that's not really true faith. Another word would be naivety. Just naive. Well, th- that's naivety, but it is presumption, right? It's presuming. I'm saying, it's, it's yeah, not I'm faith. Just into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not faith, right? When you really trust somebody, you trust them because you have a reason to trust them. Isn't this what God mm-hmm. does for each individual here, there, Theodore? Like, you know, when when God gives a uh, a revelation to a person, that's for that person to build that faith with God. And it's a one-on-one. I remember um, I've I've got lots of testimonies. I remember the youth leader at um, Geelong one year was uh, I was I, 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 I during the day I was working on the farm and into my head came maybe I should give my testimony to the youth, and I thought to myself, no, God, if you want me to give my testimony to you, you organise. And I left it at that. And that was that. This is this is how I talk to God. And anyhow, a couple of nights later, I was talking to the youth leader, a guy called Derek Bill, about, I think, doing some work on our farm so we could give him some money as, as he was as he, in his journey. And halfway through the conversation, he said to me, Felix, can you come and give your testimony to the youth? And I said, yes, I will. I said, but not because you asked, because this has been asked. And he said, I want you to give your testimony to the youth because I want them to ask, if, if, to ask themselves if they're not having the same experiences that you are why so we we my experience are not going to help you or uh, anybody in this group they're, they're they're for me i can share them and by sharing them you can you can start praying god can i have this type of experience but basically it's it's god is binding people to him and as we bind ourselves to him through the word of god then basically we have a common denominator there mm-hmm what do you think what do you think of the idea though um, i'll take exception a little bit to that that other people's experience does help me 
Uh, I heard a speaker there. Yeah, I heard a, I heard a speaker yesterday. Uh, he pushed a shopping cart across Canada walking. Um, took, a, took him a year and a half, and he raised raising money for, and awareness for homelessness. Um, but he was homeless himself, and he became a CEO of a major leading company on the cover of Canadian Business Magazine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, anyway, his his story it resonated with me, and his experience. Uh, his experience brought up in me, God witnessed to me, that the possibilities of an incredible life lived for him, led by him. Mm -hmm. And, and it just uh, the faith, the, the trust of God in God to do it for that man, not even knowing God. And then I was also able to share with him a signed copy of the great controversy and steps to Christ. I said, you know, thank you for taking all these steps to raise awareness for homelessness. I hope that the steps in this book will lead you to heaven where we can meet forever. And, uh, Amen. Well, that's, that's what I'm getting at, though, Kelly. Basically, what, what, mm -hmm. what this youth leader was saying is what I'm saying. By looking at other people, we ask ourselves, if I'm not having that re relationship, why not? And this is, when, 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 I'm, I'm, when I'm reading and listening to the, the, the conflict series, and looking at what's happening with uh, our, our patriarchs in the past, you know, when they opened their heart, they all found God. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, so hearing these experiences help us to open our heart. Is yeah. Basically, what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And so when we when we look at these doctrines here, these points that Crozier is bringing up, you know, these aren't just some theological points that we're debating, right? They're, they're really connected to the whole issue of salvation. So, and so we're just going to go through more of these points. The atonement was made in the sanctuary, but Calvary was not such a place, right? So obviously, if you don't look at the type and you just think about, well, Jesus is the Lamb of God and that's all that's important, you're going to have a distorted view of salvation. Point five, he could not, according to Hebrews 8, 4, make atonement while on earth. If he were on earth, he could not be a priest. The Levitical was the earthly priesthood, the divine, the heavenly, right? So the Levitical priesthood, obviously, Christ wasn't a Levitical priest. He's not the son of Levi, right? He's he's of the tribe of Judah. He's the son of David. So he's prophet, priest, and king, right? Um, and therefore, he did not begin the work of making the atonement, whatever the nature of that work may be, till after his ascension, when, by his own blood, he entered the heavenly sanctuary for us. Now, we had this discussion when we were looking at um, Wagner's understanding. So Wagner rejected the um, investigative judgment and the idea that Christ is making atonement, you know, because the blood's just going to be dry. Now, how could he be sprinkling his blood you know, for the last 2,000 years, right? Which, of course, is, you know, how can a man be born again? Does he have to enter into his mother's womb type of argument, right? So obviously he's taking something as literal, which obviously we understand it to be a symbol. You know, Christ isn't actually sprinkling blood. Ellen White sees him sprinkling blood in vision, not because he's actually sprinkling blood in vision, but because that's the symbolic representation of what he's doing. OK, but, you know, the argument that that Wagner tried to use was, well, you know, Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So there doesn't need to be another work going on. It's like he's already done this. He's given it to us and we just need to accept it. So the idea of him being a high priest to Wagner didn't make any sense before he died. Right. Um, that's how he came to believe it. And that's what other Christians really believe. So even though the Bible talks about Christ being our high priest, they can't take it seriously. It, it doesn't have any meaning to them, right? How, how, can you, how can you talk about Christ being a high priest if you believe that the cross was all? But then, you know, why all the types? Why all the Old Testament types if they don't have any meaning? Okay. So this then is the true light which the Lord showed Sister White in vision. Of course, this is Andreasen again. 
had his approval, that is the Lord's, and which she felt fully authorized to recommend to every saint. Only as we downgrade Sister White can we reject the tes this testimony of hers. We are not ready to do this. We now face this situation. Did our ministry author, in his thorough search, find this statement that Brother Crozier had the true light? If he did not find it, uh, he has little ground to feel pleased with his work. In either case, if I were a teacher and had sent him to do this research work, and he presented the collection of the collection in the book Questions and Doctrines as his report. I would have given him a straight F, which in school language stands for failure. It is either a case of poor research or of omission, which latter under the circumstances is most serious, right? So if somebody's just cherry picked the statements uh, to get it to agree, their thorough research to agree with their conclusion, you, you should get an F. But you also should get one if you didn't actually do your research. Okay. Isn't that, that what this is all about, uh, Theodore? What, what we're talking about people who do their research and, and know the sanctuary and can explain the sanctuary and people who, who, who finish at the cross and think that's all I need to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, we need to study God's word, right? Because, because God's word reveals to us our need of him and it reveals to us his power to save us. It is life to us. Right? We need to eat it and consume it and trust in God in spite of what we see in ourselves, in spite of what, you know, all of our failures. We can trust in God that he is going to do something in our life because we seek him every day. And that's, that's, but Theodore, that's what you think. That's what I think. I was speaking to one of my friends this week who was a friend for 50 years, and I mentioned in passing well, it won't be long before Jesus will be coming. I know he, he's never opened the Bible or done anything. He said, oh, well, bring it on. I'm looking forward to it. So there, there's your contrast. We, we've got a lot of people. I was probably the same for when I was 42 years old. You know, because I was Catholic, I thought I was going to be saved. There, there, we, we've got different groups and different levels of people. And I, yeah. I, as I said, I think the majority is um, we, we leave the sanctuary out. We change the whole Bible. And, you know, but I don't understand how you can do that because the Exodus is all, all revolves around the 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 Ark and um, and you know the the, the temporary uh, sanctuary. So, but this is what I think you're asking the question about, and this is where I think we're going here. We've got two, we've got different lots of people, and you know, the hundred forty four thousand out of eight billion people are going to be saved, really, you know. But how many people are doing what you're talking about, opening their Bible every day and more importantly, opening their heart and saying, God, what yeah. will you have me to do? Yeah. And, and, and of course, you know, other people may not be doing it, but the real question we have to ask is, you know, are we doing it? Cause I don't really have much control over what other people do. And, and, and I can hope that maybe as I seek God and seek to be a witness that it can inspire other people to desire to know God and, and to, to address the sins in their lives. But it's, but it can be a little bit discouraging, at least for me, you know, if I look at the amount of work that needs to be done, uh, you know, the mess this world is in and Kelly and I had to talk about it, you know, like if your room is messy, if your house is messy, I mean, there's no way that you can deal with the whole problem all at once, but you, you just start, you know, in the corner, you straighten up, you know, you're, you're closing your drawer or something or, you know, pick up the clothes off the floor and do the laundry, you start there. Right. I mean, sometimes things are so, they seem so insurmountable. And, and that's the way that I look at the work that needs to be done in this world is it just, it's way too much for one person to do. And and we don't seem to be able to work together, generally speaking. So how is it ever going to be done? Well, if I am connected to God and I do the part that he gives me to do each day, I will be surprised to see the results in the mm -hmm. long run. But sometimes, you know, it it takes a while for to, for those results to be clear. Sometimes it takes sometimes they're never clear. You know, we just sow and another reaps. But, you know, 
God is going to do a work and, and we just have to do the part that he's given us, which is first to address our own sins. And, Amen. you know, and that's one of the problems that I find with, you know, everybody getting caught up with, you know, the, the, the current events of the day, right? I mean, obviously, there, you know, there's prophetic events going on. But knowing what's going to happen, even if you're right, isn't going to save you, right? I mean, if you guess right, you know, let's say, you know, your belief is Trump's going to become the president and bring in the Sunday law. Well, even if you were right about that, that's not that's not how you're saved, right? It's not preparing us for that time. Right. Knowing it's, it. Knowing it. Yeah, so we have this opportunity to be prepared by how we interact with each other, how we study, how we pray for one another, and yet we seem to be focused upon, you know, if I just know these certain things and I'm right, and the other person's wrong, then I'm going to be saved because I'm right, and they're, and they're going to be lost because they're wrong. That's not, and that's not the point of Andreasen's arguments, right? It's not about who's right and who knows the truth so that they can be saved. It's understanding why the truth is important and, and why it was rejected. So it was rejected for a specific reason. It wasn't an intellectual argument that was going on. There was a... a, a Related to that person's relationship with God, these leaders, their relationship with God, they wanted to have a relationship with man. And so they set aside God's truth so that they could have a relationship with man. And so that they could they could appear good in other people's eyes. They didn't really care about God. Right. And I've and learned truth, this. Is that? I've, I've learned so much about sanctification from the recovery community from addiction mm -hmm. recovery um so something's bugging me you know this guy's doing this or that or it's bugging me so i want someone to take care of it some you know start, get that guy to stop doing that and what that does is it takes the focus off of my own program my own recovery my own healing yeah and then the idea of sanctification we see others sinning we see the headlines, we see, see things happening, and it takes the focus off of our own healing, our own you know, sanctification. Mm -hmm. So what, what they do is they say, okay, you're not able to control that person. You can't stop them from doing it. So what are you going to do? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Um, look at yourself. What can you do? about yourself and that's where I like what you say that uh, unity is an individual work because mm -hmm. so, is, so is this work that God has before us um, until we each have that individual experience for ourselves the experience of Isaiah woe is me I'm undone a man of unclean lips until we have that experience humbled in the dust daily humbled in the dust it seems like there's always something that comes up and learn that experience of facing it with god between god and i and he speaks to me and he shows me and then he lifts me up in his strength and then i don't try to look good i don't even think i'm good I, like my wor very words, like Isaiah, his, his words seemed, it was the word foul or something like this, on his lips. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm just experiencing this just in amazing ways. And, and so God allows these struggles to keep me humble while mm -hmm. he uses my life as a witness to others, and they're attracted. See, one of the main principles... If we're to do this work, is it has to be by attraction and not by promotion, not by a new program, not by a new mass evangelistic series and a mailing out of books and so on. Those are all good things. But until there's a power that attends that work, and that power is an individual life being sanctified, having the light of heaven on our countenance so that it's attractive. I walk down the street and people just look at me. I'm like, 
What are you looking at? And they're looking at the peace, the happiness. I walk with a smile most times, and I'm not even conscious of it. And, you know, to hear words when I'm in earshot, as I'm walking away after talking with people, and I say this not to be bragging or proud, but rather I was quite humbled when the lady said to the other lady that I was speaking with these two, she said, that was the kindest man I've ever met. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> whoa. Yeah. Praise, praise the Lord. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, when we're dealing with this whole issue of righteousness by faith, because we've gone through lots of, we've been doing this study now for two years, the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And, you know, we, we spent time going through A.T. Jones' presentations. And, you know, A.T. A. Jones presented the truth intellectually of righteousness by faith. And I believe he experienced it. But somewhere along the way, you know, he failed, right, as did Wagner. They failed in different ways. And, and that bring, brought, brought a disrepute to the message of righteousness by faith. And, of course, we saw what's happened, how everything has been distorted. All the language has been distorted. The nature of Christ and, and all these issues have been so distorted. The, the, the words of Scripture have, those meanings have been modified. Uh, the connotations associated with them have actually created prejudice to something like, you know, be therefore perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Oh, well, that's... You know, that's not what it says. It just it says we need to be mature, right? But, of course, mature in that context means perfect, <laughs> right? You know, so, you know, they do all this equivocation where they change the meanings of words and exchange one word for another whenever it suits them. Now, so we're not here to argue that. It's not an intellectual argument that we need. I mean, obviously, we need to understand it. But it, understanding righteousness by faith you know, intellectually, isn't sufficient because A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner understood it, but that wasn't sufficient, right? We actually have to practice it. And and so we can see the reason why people believe wrong things is because of their relationship with God. They don't want to see the truth because if they see the truth, then they think they will have to deal with their sin, which they don't want to. Right? And that's the problem that we have, right? It's not just the problem out there. It's the problem we have. So now we, we didn't really read here very much. You know, I think taking they, quite a bit of time. Yeah, go on. What, what we're saying here and what you're saying in daily relationship with God and what Kelly's saying here and what I'm saying, we each individually need our relationship with God to what we need to do each day. And I mm -hmm. believe if we're if we're doing that, God will put things in our way. Like the, the, the really the work, if anything good is going to come from God, the Holy Spirit will do it. All we need to do is do our part and stay close to God. I've all, I've asked this question many times about the hundred and forty four thousand. They follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes, and I, I know I've asked this question, and I know everyone knows when do, when does it start? And basically, how do, how do we behold Him and become changed? It's what we're talking about here in this and. Kelly's talking about that we each individually need to be going to God and talking to him. When I talk to people about religion, um, I, I ask them to just have a, an honest relationship with God and just talk to him as your best friend. I said, he is your best friend. You mightn't realize it. And just ask him what I need to do. And I, I think I've told you this to me, of simple things that God has done for people and shown them what they need to do. And mm -hmm. basically that that is how we increase our faith and trust in him by Opening the word, recognizing the war for the mind, I found is a, a, a one of the biggest things, and and staying focused. You know, we talked about Wagner and Jones. You know, they were focused, but they lost their focus. And why yeah. was it? Because of man around them that argued with them. I don't know, but basically, for for me, my salvation has to keep focus. I have to keep focused, and no matter what's happening in and around my life, I need to take it to God in prayer, and He He never lets us down. Yeah, I know. If I if I start focusing on what's happening around me, I I just get exhausted, right? But if I if I spend the time just with God each moment, and just do the tasks that are before me, and don't think about how much needs to be done, 
I can I can actually enjoy you know, the things that God gives me to do. I can be at peace with Him. Amen. But but I do often get really caught up in all of the the drama of the world of what's happening and also the uncertainty about what's happening. Right. So, you know, sometimes things go over and over in my mind and that's the battle for the mind. Right. So, yeah. you know, so I, you know, that's why the Sabbath is so nice because, <laughs> you know, I can sort of set aside, at least that's the ideal is I can set aside a lot of these worries and just spend time in nature with God and, and, uh, you know, so so the Sabbath is really a blessing. The studies we have are a blessing. Like this Friday night study is always a blessing to go through this. Because, you know, I'm always my favorite. Yeah. I'll, the always studies tire me that, too. Yeah, Friday night and Sabbath morning. Yeah. So, like, even the morning studies, they're tiring me out. But when I get to Friday, it's like somehow the Friday night study it is. It's not that necessarily that it's a better study, but it's just, it, it's Sabbath is what I think it is. And uh, also the topic, you uh, really, really, really love this topic of righteousness mm-hmm. by faith. Yeah. Yeah, well, I definitely like it. I mean, it's, it's uh, where the pavement meets the road, as I always like to say. So, so we have this next you always section. Got a funny, you always have What's a funny that? twist. You always have a funny twist on these <laughs> colloquial. Yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, this next section, I don't think I want to read it right now. So, but, um, you know, so we didn't read very much, but we could see that these issues that were given to Adventists after October 22nd, 1844. This message of the sanctuary, we could see how that message was not understood and how related it is to righteousness by faith. That is, they were not capable to enter into God's kingdom because they hadn't had an experience that that they could just enter into God's kingdom. Right. Even though they had light, the Millerites had light. That wasn't the light that Christ could then come back, right? That the light that they had was sufficient for them for that time, but it wasn't the full light of the righteousness of Christ shining upon them. And, you know, and the question is, you know, do we have that light? We believe that we do. Alan White says that that message is going to go forth and it's going to that glory is going to be seen upon his people. And so that's the thing that we need to be seeking, right? So even in in all of these studies that we've done, you know, God's shown us a lot of things. And we probably still have some things wrong and things that need to be corrected. But may I, may I it, interject there? You said something yeah. pretty key that this okay. message is going to go forth and, and the, the, it'll be seen in the people. So I think one of the mistakes uh distractions uh anyway people take a, a side side road they take the wrong fork in the road when thinking about giving this message of righteousness by so they think that if we understand it perfectly and give this message in by word and sermon that that's the message that will go forward but it's a living message it mm-hmm. has to be alive right it's it's yeah. not just the words. The words are important, but to teach others about it. But you know, some our lives are the only Bible some people will ever read, sort of thing. That same. So that that's when the light of God will it will lighten the earth. It will be in the lives. Of the people. And it's not. It, and it's not that we see ourselves as righteous, and that's so that other people see us as righteous. Actually, Amen. those that that are going to see us as righteous, those that are going to be drawn to God, it's because God is doing a work in them, and and, and it's because there is would be a humility in us. We wouldn't see ourselves as righteous. I mean, that's one of the things that's going to attract them. The person who puffs himself up as being righteous isn't going to attract anyone, and yet that's what we sort of think we have to do. That we have to somehow 
appear righteous in our own eyes in order for people to see Christ's righteousness. But actually, we have to have the meekness and lowliness of Christ. We have to see ourselves as sinners in order for people to be attracted and see Christ in us. Uh, that's right, to see ourselves as sinners and yet still be gracious, kind, and loving. Yeah, no, nobody's going to be attracted to somebody who's self-righteous, right? Or be it, think that that's attractive, that, you know, oh, that person, he's, he's really self-righteous. He must, he must really know God. Right. He really he really knows the scriptures, so he can point out all the errors that everybody has and call them satanic errors and yeah. darkness. But really that when we speak those kind of words, that is darkness on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it you know, I mean obviously, you know, as we study the scriptures we come to know things. But those the knowing of things is not salvation. Intelligence is not salvation. Knowledge is not salvation, just a, even a knowledge of the scriptures, unless it is applied to the life. And, and so, you know, we can have knowledge, but it's not according, you know, to salvation. It's not salvational knowledge. It's just, and, and, and this is the frustration, I guess, I have, because I deal with people all the time on social media who have the truth, and, and sometimes I get so discouraged because they don't have the truth in every way that they act. You know, they don't, they don't have the truth, right? Then people who have commented on my videos, you know, believe they're a prophet or whatever, or they come and attack, you know, something I said. And like, they're not, they're definitely not attracting me to, to anything. And, and, you know, and, and what they want to draw out, of me is an argumentative spirit so that they can feel that they're better than me because, you know, I, I call them an idiot or something, you know, it, it doesn't really help anybody. And so, you know, we have to be really, really careful on, on why we're even discussing any of these things, even these letters to the churches. Cause I know people who have read these letters to the churches and don't manifest a Christ-like character to anyone. Right. You know, they, they believe in these doctrines, but they definitely don't represent Christ because they're argumentative, right? Maybe I'm one of those, you know, um, right? So, so God's got to do something about us. And the only way he can do that is if we let him. And that's, mm -hmm. that's really what this work is about. That's why we study. Well, can I just read uh, Revelation 14, 4 again? Yep. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they were are virgins. These are they that follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Is this rounding up what we're saying today about each of us having a relationship with God and and then letting others you know, let your light shine, let the God because we have to remember God is, is our salvation and that's what we need to be pointing to all the time and you know the best way to point is to basically um look keep looking yourself and and let others see you're looking in a direction that uh, where, where you're going mm -hmm. and as i said this is these, these are following the lamb they've been redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto god and the lamb mm -hmm. it, it's something that um we need to keep focused no matter what happens our, our way. And it's a matter of, you know, God, what would you have me to do? And why is this happening? And where am I going now? What should I read? Which way should I go? And we should mm -hmm. be talking talking, and then listening all the time. And I believe God is guiding everyone if we just listen and not yeah. get distracted. There's too mm -hmm. many distractions. And, 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 and we need to recognize that in other people, even when uh, we, we don't recognize it that God is working in other people's lives, sometimes in ways that we don't realize. So anyway, I'm really tired. So let's close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this past week, for the difficulties that we have faced, for the blessings that we have received from your hand, and for the love and compassion that you've shown us in spite of ourselves. And we just ask, Lord, that you can be with each person who is studying, 
that we can all come to know you, that we can know that you love us and that uh, the sins we see in ourselves are not something that's going to cause you to reject us, but you died for us because we were sinners. And so we give our hearts and lives to you. We ask that you can use us and we thank you for the Sabbath. We pray that it'll be a blessing to each person and uh, continue to help us as we um, and strengthen us as we rest in you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.